it's not always talent when that that will yield success but it's work it's hard work it's persistence it's perseverance it's consistency and belief and faith that you can get it done so i wanted to share that from a layman's a layman's uh point and just how you're capable of way more than you think you are and and i know you 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 10x it we 10 we can 10x it all of us can 10x all the time All right. Hey, what's up, Masters? Welcome to another episode of Path to Mastery podcast. Today, we're with Mr. Bill Murphy. What's up, Bill Murphy? How are you, sir? Hey, David. Happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, brother. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. And I just realized that my camera now is so high that I have to look up to actually look at it. I reposition things. But listen, it's uh, I we we know each other well. Um, so it's, it's good to see you, man. Congratulations on your new book. That's super cool. Thriving in the storm and interesting. Cause you know, you are, you've been doing real estate, uh, the mortgage side of the real estate business a long time. And we, you, you are our primary guy, as long as I was selling real estate for our team. And, uh, and now, you know, you got an awesome book. You've done a lot of big things. So but we were talking earlier and I asked you about the, the times and you said, well, it's a, it's a little slow this time now, but you've never seen it like this. So let's, let's, let's start there, man. And then, and then we'll get into the book. How does that sound? That sounds great. Yeah. So 25 years in, in this uh, incredibly crazy business of real estate and mortgages, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of, a lot of the same stuff, you and I, and uh some ups and downs and, and, you know, there's a lot of turnover both as agents and lenders and it is, it is slow. I mean, it's slow because of inventory it's slow because um, you know, a ton of pre-approved buyers um, saw interest rates double. Now, David, this is, this has never happened before. Interest rates doubled for the very first time in one year. Hmm. So we went from the start of the year at 3%. And we hit, it almost went up two and a half times or three, three times. We went, we were touching 8% in interest rates. Now, when these buyers double their payments, when they were pre-approved in, you know, once upon a time, and they go back to look at what their payment's going to be, you know, they lost all their purchase power. So many of them just hit the pause button. And that's, that's where we're at, at right now. And I got to tell you, um, just knowing you for years and knowing uh, how hard you worked and um, building your teams, you were a prospecting machine. And I learned a lot from you um, watching you with your teams and you had top producing teams in, in, uh, in Central Mass. And you were relentless with your prospecting and you were banging the phones and you were just, you had your call hours, your power hours. And I think, you know, I don't think, I know that we've been so lucky as agents and lenders where business has just been, it's been coming to us that now we have to go back to basics and start, start doing old school prospecting again and, and banging those phones as hard as we possibly can and, and, and schedule, schedule that time. And, and we're not be, it's not, we're not beyond that. No matter how much success we've had in, in the past oh. or in sales, we're not beyond power hours of prospecting, right? Well, so I, I, my apologies, man. I, I lost you for about 10 seconds. I mean, not even maybe like four or five seconds. I, I appreciate last thing you were saying about us prospecting every day. And honestly, we still do it. I just teach other people to do it now. And I do it with other real estate agents. Um, yeah. or, and you know, we still are always, I'm more of an investor now, so I'm always looking for property. So I still call looking for, you know, multifamily short sales, you know, uh, deals, things like that. Right. Um, but I missed the end. My apologies. I just completely lost the connection. It's first time I lost. I learned so much from you over the years and you prospecting with your teams and doing those power hours that it just, it's tried and true. And we're not beyond no matter how much success we've had, we're not beyond prospecting. So as much as the business has come to us easily, 
uh, for those experienced agents and, and loan officers, it's time to, it's time to go do the old school work again. Yeah. Well, I, that prospecting time. Yeah, man. Um, well, you know, I, I, I get it, brother. I don't think we ever should have stopped. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we, we never did. Right. I mean, and yeah, I love that you said that because this is what we do every day. We have a community, we get together, people jump on, people are making calls, people are supporting each other. You know, I'll text, I'll send you a link, man. You can, you're welcome to jump in and check out the community. And if you have some loan offices, how, how many are on your team right now? I got some young, young kids that were trying to teach the business too. They just got licensed. So they were, they were interns and now they're in, in sales. Yeah. And then I got some experienced loan officers um, also that are, that are, they're needing to prospect too. So we're all on the same, we're all on the you same. Know what? Why don't we do this? And I know this is uh, we're, we're just kind of chopping it up, but I want, I want to, let me do a free training for you guys. Let me come in and do a free training for you and your team after. So sure, love that. So let's so let's talk about it though. Interest rates you mentioned uh, they've they've gone up twice. It's it's double. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it it's it's went from three percent to six and seven percent. I mean, in reality, it's. I mean, I bought my first house. I bought my first house from you, right? I think you helped me buy Robertson Road, yeah. and it was six and a half percent, and that was a good rate. Remember? Good rate, yeah. Back in the day, right? Yeah. Now people are freaking out because the rates are six and a half and seven. I mean, what do you what do you say to that? Because well, think about it. Our our number one demographic or age group of buyers is first time home buyers, right? They account for about thirty five percent of all purchases. They've never seen they've never seen rates in the fours and fives. They were used to the threes, and and when they got pre approved, they they were at a three percent or a four percent payment. And now it, it touches seven and a half, seven and three quarters, almost 8%. And their payment more than doubles. So uh, they they get scared and they back out. And, you know, now that that whole first time home buyer thing is they may be le less segment of the population buying because of the because of what they were comfortable with. So it's, it all comes down to purchase power. So um, just a simple stat with. Rates at three and three quarters, you know, you could have been pre-approved at three hundred eighty thousand at your at your max. Now rates are back down into the high fives, low sixes. Now they just gained pre-approval purchase power of, you know, four hundred and call it forty thousand or so for the same payment. So mm -hmm. they don't. A lot of these buyers that backed out and hit the pause button don't realize that their purchase power is back because rates have come down a little bit and we expect them to continue to come back down into next year. Well, the other thing too is in, in you get, you know, again, me not, I haven't, you know, I haven't worked with buyers in a long time. I've yeah. worked on the listing side, but I mean, think about the buyers right now where everybody's on the fence, but you know, six months ago you were getting 3%, but they were also paying 50,000 over asking. They were buying houses with no appraisal, no home inspection. And, and now, you know, now they have some opportunity to negotiate, right? They can have an inspection. They, they can have an appraisal. Yep. Um, so is now the time to wait or do you, should we be, should people be taking advantage of it? Well, just, and to add to what you just said with, with paying so much over asking, you just eliminated all the competition with these multiple offer situations. Mm -hmm. So now you can go in and you can go back to negotiating in a lot of cases. You can have your comfort of an inspection and an appraisal and not have to worry about um, issues there because if it if it doesn't inspect well or appraise high enough, you can go back and negotiate that too. But, but that's why I think NAR had some stats out about buyer's remorse over the last year and a half, two years. All these people were... Oh, yeah. All these people were buying homes without inspections, without appraisals. They're having issues. But here's the one thing with the buyer's remorse is they were settling. They were on their 10th, 12th, 15th house where they put in offers and lost out. And they're like, you know what? If it has a roof and it has some shingles and a bathroom and a bedroom, I want to buy it, you know, because I'm sick of losing out. And then they then they hate the house. Yeah. So you're going you're gonna to see a lot of these houses, I believe, come on the market again. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, what do you think about the foreclosures that there's a lot of people talking about foreclosures and other stuff happening? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so we have so much equity 
I, I just would believe that people would sell before they would let themselves get into foreclosures. And it's not even a short sale situation. It's they've created, I mean, you know, when we were up t- over two and a half years, about 35, 40% in equity in our area. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, so we're not going to see like people being upside down no. in the hardship situation. And no. that, and that's the, that's, that's the thing too, that's important for people to understand is we do have equity now and it doesn't, and I can't imagine prices are going to go down. I mean, maybe, maybe a little bit, right. But not, not like it was in 2005, six. And no. I think there's the people, I, there's a lot of people comparing it to that time, but you and I went through that time. It was a lot yeah. different. Yeah, there was way more houses for sale back then. There was a surplus of homes. We're we're short. We have a huge uh, inventory shortage, as you know, right now. So, um, and then with all the millennials, your largest se- segment of the population still buying, that that's not going away anytime soon. We got three or four years of this uh, abundance in 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 uh, home sales. I'm not worried about uh, 2008 repeating itself again. Yeah, you, we, you just gotta you just gotta get some buyers, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, and we'll we'll help you with that. But listen, let's um, let's jump into your book. I I want to get into your book as well. Uh, but I also we're on Clubhouse. By the way, Clubhouse, this is a live. Bill's not on Clubhouse, which is why we don't have his profile on here for you guys. He doesn't he didn't even never even heard of Clubhouse. It's because the guy's always got his head in the tr- in the trenches, just working right. Yeah. Over one point five billion in loans closed. So this kid's no joke. Um, but I want to also let people know, uh, you know, we're sponsored by a real estate university in which if you is, is our, is our daily community with a daily huddle. Uh, we also have over 75 virtual online lessons and growing. And if people want to try the community, just go to try dot David Hill dot club. And you can try the community for seven days for $7. So if you want to check out our real estate community, check that out. All right, so Bill, let's talk about your book now, um, Thriving in the Storm. So what? tell us about your book. And well, first off, why did you write this book? So I wrote it for a couple of reasons, David. Uh, what, the one, one main factor was, you know, I believe that we're capable of way more than we, we think we are. And so I wanted to get that message out there. It's not always, it's not always talent when that, that will yield success, but it's work, it's hard work, it's persistence, it's perseverance, it's consistency and belief and faith that you can get it done. So I wanted to share that from a layman's, a layman's uh, point and just how you're capable of way more than you think you are. And, and I know you're, you, you 10X it. We, 10, we can 10X it. All of us can 10X all the time. And I just think we, we uh, get caught up in our own thoughts of fear and self-doubt where we don't. So you just got to ha- have some belief um, that that can be done. And the other part of that was, you know, creating a thriving mindset. Now, a lot of times when we hit adversity or challenges or obstacles in our, in our lives or our day to day, you know, it's easy to lay down and quit and say, I'll, I'll do this again tomorrow. And that's, you know, I call that the victim mentality. Like you're going to be, you're going to give in to your circumstances and let your circumstances I, identify you and quit. No, man, you, you, you gotta, you gotta rise up, rise above. And that's where you get the thriving mentality. And then sandwiched in between that is the survival mentality where, um, you know, you just kind of wait for the storm to pass. You wait for the adversity to pass. I'm just going to wait, wait this out. And I'm surviving. You know, you hear that all the time. Hey, how are you? I'm surviving. You know, like, why not thrive? Why not always be thriving? Right. So if you're thriving, you're on top of the world and, and, and you're getting through it. And it's it's very it's very motivational to know that you you are capable of way more than than you think you are when you create that thriving mindset that I'm going to get this done no matter what it takes. Yeah, no, I I love that mindset. And. I was talking about it this morning and you know it's it's that ability to you know what the goal is you know where you're going and you, it's relentless it's like it's like you're doing an iron man race right you like you've done multiple iron mans i've done a half uh and and i want to do another half with you hopefully this spring yeah and but it's that ability to no matter how difficult it gets you know i just remember being on the on the um i think it was the bike 
yeah, the bike and um, just like, I don't think my legs will go anymore. <laughs> but then all of a sudden you do, you know, you do like an energy shot, an energy gel. And then five minutes later, you forgot that your legs weren't working anymore and you're just moving. Right. It's that, it's that ability. Does that, did that, did that play into you writing a book as well? Like your experience doing all those Ironman races? Oh yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you a story. It was in 2019 when I was, it was a culmination of notes over the years. 2019, I ran, I ran my fifth Boston marathon. Right. And nor I haven't swam in 30 years and I haven't, and I didn't have a bike and probably haven't biked in 25 years. So I was just running. Right. So I was running about Boston marathon and I didn't prepare with my nutrition properly. I, I ran my runs, but I didn't prepare with my nutrition. So it was a crazy new England day in 2019 where it was, I think it started out at 40 degrees. It was windy, rainy, maybe even some flurries. And then it, it was, uh, it went up to like 68, 70 and sunny. And, and then it started pouring at the end. So within four and a half hours, I was, uh, I was, I had crazy cramps about mile 15 because I, I wasn't taking my nutrition. I wasn't taking my gels. I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't fuel with my electrolytes. I didn't do the right things. Right. Cause I was just like, I'm going to coast through this thing, but mm. it, it, it took advantage of me. And it really, it, it, I, I, I had to walk every mile from mile 15 to mile 26 for about two tenths of a mile, every mile on the mile. So I was so upset with myself. I was so frustrated that I didn't pay attention to, to what I needed to do fundamentally. And then in th that, that day I decided, I was like, you know what? I got to try this mental toughness to take it to another level. And I was like, the hardest thing I can think of anybody doing in an endurance uh, race is a, would be like an Ironman, right? So started training in six months that year um, for, for the Ironman. And it just, it just became a mindset thing that I started journaling about how I was feeling. Now, the, the day, the day I got my bike, I went to the bike store and they, they fitted me and they had me ride in the parking lot and I couldn't get my cleats out and I fell over in front of everybody I did that too, at, I at, acting like bike. I knew what I was doing. Right. So it was so embarrassing, man. <laughs> I, I was going to throw that bike in the woods. Right. And quit right there. And then, and then I got in the pool in the first and, and we swim with the Y man. And the first two laps, I got out of the pool and I sat on the edge and I was shaking my head with anxiety and fear, just saying, I, I don't know if I could do this. And the thing, the thing that kept coming back to me is I declared to a lot of people that I was going to do this Ironman, mainly my kids. And I was like, all right, you got to get back in the pool and you got to clip in back on the bike and you got to do the work. It will get easier. It will get better. But you declared it and you're modeling this for your, your family and your kids. You got to do it, man. You got to show up and do it. So when you declare something out loud into the world, uh, that's the biggest accountability partner you can have. Amen, brother. It's yeah. it's I, I only laugh when you said that about the bike because I've never <laughs> shared this with anybody. But the first time I rode my bike, I you know, I was riding and then I came to an intersection and there was a car and I got nervous and stopped fast and fell right over. Yeah. And then the people got out of the car. Hey, you OK? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Jump off. But, you know, I, I trashed my knee. It was it was pretty oh. bad, man. Yeah. And every cyclist, yeah. every every I try out, they've it. It, yeah. all done it. Then the maybe time. they'll admit it on the don't podcast. do it anymore. But yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. actually, I yeah. did it twice. It happened to me twice. The second yeah. time, I think too. It's um, embarrassing, it, but it is what. It, yeah, it's part of the part of the learning process. So awesome. Oh, you know what I want to do is I want to open it up. We got some people on Clubhouse right now. Um, I'd love to see if uh, uh, anybody on Clubhouse has a question for Bill. Uh, we got Chante, we got Derek. Uh, either of you guys uh, have a question for Bill Murphy? Um, I have a question. I, I didn't get to catch the first part of the interview. Bill, can you um, hear Shantae? Yep. Okay. Um, I didn't get to hear the first part of it, so I don't know if he shared it yet or not. But, you know, I was just curious as to how, like, how long did you have to, you know, get used to the, the the crutches and just you know going through that whole motion was that like not just your legs but was that hard on just everything in your body how how, how did you get through that endurance oh the the marathon of crutches yeah yeah so that so you so you read the book i think um the the marathon on crutches was 
I was training and it, we were supposed to do it uh, in October because it was canceled because of COVID. That was uh, last year, 2021, right? And so um, I was on my way to uh, to go to a run and I slipped down the stairs walking. I slipped down my stairs going outside and I blew out my quad. I had surgery the next day and we were exactly 60 days out from the Boston Marathon. So I was running for make a wish. And so the make wish people said, Oh, sorry, you can't compete this year in the marathon. And I was like, well, I'm doing it for make a wish. I want to raise the money. They're like, well, you can do it next year. And I said, well, there's gotta be a way we can do it on crutches. And, um, we were able to get a venue. Well, first of all, the BAA Boston athletic association turned us down. They wouldn't let, because of liability purposes, they wouldn't let us do the marathon on crutches. So I went to my old alma mater, Worcester state college, and I was able to, um, approach them and they, they let us use the football field and the, and the track that day for the, the virtual Boston marathon on crutches. And, but what, so the funny thing that happened was I was training and I was doing loop uh, loops around huh. my pool. This was how, how pathetic this was. And the, for 60 days and the, the chafing and the blood under my armpits and everything else was, was just, it was, I was callousing my arms. So then it came marathon day and, and all these people saying, your arms must be killing you. Your arms must be killing you. I was like, no, they're not, they're not even bloody today because they were so callous from all the training, mm. but I was on pace to do that marathon on crutches. The very first day I did it uh, in training would have took me over 13 hours to finish it. We ended up finishing in just over six hours, six hours and 17 minutes, which is actually an unofficial world record that I didn't even know about. But um, it, it, that happened. But it was like the what took me through that marathon that day was a make a wish kid who joined me for my last three miles. And she she walked with me. And she's doing very well. And she, she lifted me up with her enthusiasm, her energy and how appreciative she was for me doing a marathon on crutches for make a wish. And the, the, the kind of funny part of all that on the crutch marathon was my best three miles were the last three miles with that make a wish kit because of her, her energy was just so, so contagious. That's awesome. Wow. That's, that is incredible. And man, I can't, I can't even imagine because I know what it's like when you go through that part of the calluses and, you know, the rubbing and the sensitivity and gosh, man, kudos to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Shantae. Appreciate that. Yeah. Shantae's awesome. She's a real estate agent. Um, she is located in, uh, where, where are you again, Shantae? I forget my apologies. Pennsylvania. That's okay. I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, too, yeah, I was close. <laughs> Pennsylvania. My bad. Um, yeah, Tucson, Arizona. So, Bill, do you do Tucson, Arizona? Do you cover that area? No, no, no okay. I don't. All right, got it. Okay, so referrals. All yes. right, anyway, all right, good stuff. Well, listen, um, let's uh, here's something that I was, as I'm listening to this, and again, I experienced this because I also completed the the Ironman, the, the Lake Placid 70.3, and I had to train for that. And you would think that it would make your business suffer. But what ended up happening is my business actually exploded as I was doing that. Um, do you did you see a correlation like that as well, David? You just gave me the chills, man. I'm gonna tell you why. I just I did a talk on this that year when I was I was so white knuckling my business, right? I was stuck. My business, even though I had nice numbers and success, my business and it was a top producer. My business was about just under seventy million for a whole decade. And I couldn't break through it with all the coaching, with all the guidance, with all the, with everything that was going on. I just couldn't break through that number. And when I focused on that Ironman, in those six months, I finished that Ironman in November of 2019. I completed the year at $80 million in volume that year, which was my best year ever. I had my best income year ever. And it was, it was, I released the white knuckles, right? And you just let it go to the universe. The world, you know, you already, everybody knew what you needed to do. You, you knew what you needed to do, but you had to let go a little bit and not grip it so hard and, and then do something else physical. And man, that momentum carried, carried through the year. So it's so funny you say that because it's true. 
if you let go of something that you're just pressing too damn hard and you focus on something else, uh, some other physical um, activity, physical goal, it's, it's, uh, it's magic what happens in your business when you just, when you just let go a little bit. It really is. Dude. I'm like scared to say this right now, but I think I want to make that commitment to do the race with you in Texas Let's do it, in man. April, man. I think that's the next thing to do. I feel Let's like I need it. something like that to push so me. So if you declare this, you're, I, you're, you're I committed. To, I have <laughs> to do it. I'm declaring it right now in this podcast. I'm, I love I'm it, screwed, brother. All right, let's roll. All right, cool. I, I think we got, uh, we got Benjamin I might have a question. Uh, Benjamin, do you have a question, sir? All right. So maybe, maybe not. Okay. Well, listen, um, resilience, that's, that's what I'm taking from this conversation. Um, what would you say right now to people, uh, you know, out there, a lot of real, you know, the uh, majority of our listeners are, uh, you know, in sales, real estate, mortgage, insurance, financial services, auto, we're all feeling it, right? Um, what would you say to those people right now about, these, these times, you know, build, build your fortress, right? Cause you're going to have bad days. So when I talk about building your fortress, I'm talking about making sure you're going into every single day prepared. And it's not just prepared with your calendar. It's prepared, prepared with your, your mindset. Right. So, so you got to have a morning routine and, and David, I know you have a morning routine, man. And that morning routine should should look something like this. Maybe some journaling, some, you know, count your blessings and gratitude because that will change your state. If you're down, you're out and you just you're you're, you're not feeling it. Just give thanks for just, you know, your health, your kids health, your families, your career, whatever. And watch your physiology just just change. Get your workouts in. I mean, maybe you're a nighttime. Maybe you do your, your workouts at nighttime, but but man, I, I have to get it done in the morning. And, and so what happens is when you start to have these routines and when stuff comes at you and you're having a rough day or the interest rates go too high or you lose that buyer or, or just the appraisal doesn't come in high enough or whatever it is, you're prepared because you can handle the stress mm -hmm. a lot better than if you didn't come into the day prepared. If you maybe had two or three glasses of wine the night before and you didn't sleep well, and now you have this stress in your life, and you didn't build your fortress already, you're going to have a hard time dealing with that stress. And what I find the difference between those that are successful and those that are mediocre, the mediocre folks quit the debt when that stuff yeah. happens. The successful people, they'll brainstorm, they'll huddle with, with everybody they can, they'll seek wise counsel, they'll, they'll do whatever they need to because – they're saying, you know what? This is just, this is just a temper. This is a temporary situation. I'm going to get through it. I'm not going to hide under my desk and wait for the storm to pass because th that's just going to lead to more problems tomorrow. So handle it, handle it head on. But so create that fortress in the morning, and then also at the end of the day, not just the morning. You got to bookend it. So so you got to practice. You know. Don't binge watch Netflix before you go to bed every night, or or watch crazy news. Uh, you know, I, I try to journal a little bit. You know, five minutes. It just put my mind in a good place before I go to bed, so I can wake up in a in a good you know wake up in a good place and then do the same thing over. So, bookending your day helps you build build up for whatever's going to come at you, and, and it's going to happen. Things are going to come at you every single day, and it's how you take it. Yeah, man. Awesome. I love it. Well, let me, um, you know, there was, I, there was something I was going to add, but I'll, I'll let it go. Um, but we do, again, I want to let people know about real estate university. Um, you can check it out at davidhill.club or you can go for seven days and try, uh, try us out for seven days for seven bucks. If you don't like it, it's the price of a Starbucks. You can then get your you can cancel after seven days. You never charged again. Try dot David Hill dot club. Check it out. Uh, I got that little thing going across the screen right there. So make sure you check that out. Also, Bill, how do people get a copy of your book? What's the best way for people to access your, your book? Yeah, you can go on Amazon. Um, it's uh, on Amazon or wherever books are sold, or if they want to get, you know, bulk orders, 
um, we can certainly do that on the website, thrivingthestorm.com. Awesome. And I am going to, I just made the commitment, bro. I'm going to do the race with you. So just got to tell right. my wife and we'll uh, connect. as long as she doesn't say anything crazy, I, I'm good to go. <laughs> and I'm, ex I'm excited. Like, seriously, like I feel like just making that commitment. I don't know. It does something to you, right? Just, do you, does you feel that? Feels like you don't good. feel me, but I feel like, okay, I made a commitment. Now it's like, there's another level. Yeah, man, I feel your energy, man. I feel your energy. Look at you. You know, I just, we just turned it up a couple notches. Here. Yeah. I love it. That's, that's as soon as you may, it's in the, for everybody listening right now, as soon as you commit to something, it brings you into the thing, right? Like it moves you up a level. That's commitment. It it's certainty, right? And that that's what it's all about, man. So Bill, I appreciate you, uh, man. I'm glad we had this conversation. I'm glad we're going to figure out this race together. I haven't trained for a race in years, so it's time <laughs> to get back on. Yeah. And how do you train, by the way, in the, in the, well, I guess uh, you don't ride outside now because it's too yeah. cold. Well, I'm so, in Florida uh, right now, David. I'm, I'm, I'm training down here. In, oh, you're in, in Florida. Florida. Yeah. Okay. Just for the week. So I, I'm going to okay. come down a few, every few weeks to train on the bike. Oh, good. good for you, man. I love it. All right, cool. Well, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And all right. Final thoughts. Um, final, final words for everybody listening today. Um, what's the one thing you want them to take from this conversation today, Bill? Uh you know, prepare, prepare and prepare your day with resilience, consistency, you know, be consistent every day. Don't just do the things once in a while, have that routine in the beginning of the day and the end of the day, and you will, you will see uh, transformation in your life. I love it. I love how you went back to the routine. So appreciate you, sir. Make sure you go get a copy of Bill Murphy's book. Thank you for listening to podcasts and we'll see you soon.